The following is an interview with Dr. Asa Mittman, a professor of art history at California State University, Chico, and the author of Maps and Monsters in Medieval England, published in 2006, co-author with Susan Kim of Inconceivable Beasts, The Wonders of the East in the Beowulf Manuscript, published in 2013, co-author with Sherry Lindquist of Medieval Monsters, Terrors, Aliens, and Wonders, which is a major part of this interview. He's also the founding president of Miark Stapa. Monsters, the Experimental Association for the Research of Cryptozoology through Scholarly Theory and Practical Application. I invited Dr. Mittman to talk about medieval monsters and how medieval Europeans constructed their worldview. We had a great conversation, but it does meander a bit, so I ended up splitting it into two parts. A slight, slight content warning? There is a, a rather oblique discussion of sexuality, nothing explicit, nothing lurid, but sexuality does come up in the episode, so if you're particularly sensitive... You know, just be aware. So let's jump right into another episode of Goblinological Fantasies. I actually did purchase Maps and Monsters in Medieval England. I haven't read through it much yet. Um, the the one I actually enjoyed more was the one with more well with the uh, the prettier pictures, maybe the color ones, the Medieval Monsters, Terrors, Aliens, and Wonders. The yes. one you did with the uh, what is their name again? Uh, Sherry Lindquist. Okay, yeah, Sherry Lindquist. Okay, yeah. So I might refer to that more often in this interview. Um, sure. Yeah. That, I mean, that was uh, an enormously exciting project to work on. Uh, the The exhibition that that came out of was literally, you know, my dream from when I was in college, um, <laughs> and I never thought it would actually happen. And so I was absolutely thrilled um, to to work on that. And I agree, the book came out gorgeous. Uh, it's definitely the prettiest thing I will ever publish. I find it so funny that you put this picture of a monster eating a person like right on the cover yeah um in one of the places the exhibition the book was based on opened it opened uh, at a couple of museums it opened at one in um in texas uh the blanton and it there they had taken some of the images and blown them up sort of wall size decals and that image of the tarask which is what that thing is on the cover that's eating the person was you know, the whole image was blown up to be probably 10 feet tall. Uh, <laughs> that That is amazing. Um, it, it really gave it a monstrous scale then. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, it's an odd uh, creature, the Tarask, um, because it's one. Of, it's like a one-off. It's There's just the one of them. Um, and it's not, you know, it connected out to some larger specific mythology aside from you know that monsters are strange creatures that are dangerous and made up of sort of bits and pieces of other things usually but um but it was reported um to be ravaging an area in france um until you know a saint went and tamed it um at which point then other people killed it uh <laughs> but um but yeah it's an unusual monster but that image is so lavish uh it's so just so beautiful for an image of a guy being guzzled down his mouth, you know. <laughs> Love the feet dangling. I mean, like, this is an interesting point with with the feet dangling outside of the monster's mouth. It's, mm -hmm. I think most of the time when we're thinking of pre-modern art, we're sort of thinking in terms of, like, Egyptian art where everything's super flat or, um, like, really symbolic. It kind of doesn't make sense. But this is one where it's actually sort of dipping into the kind of, like, more naturalistic, more kind of comic booky sort of art tradition that we're getting out of the modern period. So it just tickles my fancy so much. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very late um, manuscript. We call it, if something's a, an illuminated manuscript, we tend to call it medieval. But if we were looking at, say, a panel painting from this period, we might be thinking of it as being from the Renaissance. You know, these divides are arbitrary. Yeah, it's a kind of naturalistic image. It has atmospheric perspective in it. So the hills in the background are fading off into uh, increasingly pale shades of blue, you know, to indicate that there's whatever moisture and so on in the atmosphere that actually, this actually happens when you look out at a great distance, right? Hills in the distance fade and turn bluish. And so it has these kinds of markers of uh, what we would think of as Renaissance naturalism, but then there's this spectacular, crazy monster guzzling this guy down. And the other thing that I really love about it is, I mean, it's got to be kind of comical, right? <laughs> I get that it's a terrifying thing to be eaten by the monster, but first off, the monster is adorable and looks sort of like a corgi gone awry. He's got these tiny little squat legs, 
big round sort of oil drum belly. And he looks almost distressed by the guy in his throat. And those feet, just the the blue tights and those little black shoes, there's just something uh, inarguably comic, I think, about it. Um, And that may be possible here because the rope is already around its neck, because it's already tamed. Um, And it's already actually being stabbed. The threat is over. And so monsters can be funny or amusing, you know, uh, light and entertaining. As long as they aren't threatening, you know? <laughs> and this one is no longer threatening. I think that that is one of the things, like, looking at this, that one of the ones that, like, really strikes me about it is, yeah, the rope around its neck. And it's... <sighs> that is such a nice kind of succinct sort of symbol of subjugation, right? The rope around the neck. So it's just yeah. funny that it's really terrifying, but also already got a collar on. <laughs> right. Um, and... You know, there are some other images. This isn't like uh, unique for a monster to be collared. They're not common, but they do show up. Um, maybe the, the most famous of these is the unicorn tapestries uh, at the cloisters in New York. Um, these absolutely glorious, beautiful, late, late medieval tapestries. If you just Google um, unicorn tapestries, they should come right up. There are two sets of unicorn tapestries. One's in the Met cloisters and the others in the Louvre. Um, so you want the one that's in the cloisters. Uh, the ones in the Louvre are all red. Uh, so you'll know right away if you're looking at the right one or not. Um, and they are often associated, though I, the documentary evidence on this is not really there, but decent theory, um, that they were associated with a marriage or betrothal. Um, and the there's a sequence of the unicorn being hunted. Um, and unicorns were... Uh, associated with um, masculinity and power and violence. I know that nowadays, you know, <laughs> they tend to be associated with, um, I don't know, rainbow colored stickers and, uh, you know, gentler things in the universe. But um, uh, the the unicorn, the only way that a unicorn could be captured, they thought in the Middle Ages, was for a female virgin to sit herself down in the forest and, Uh, her virginity itself would somehow attract this creature, which would then, oh so Freudian, lay its head with its long horn into her lap. Um, (laughs) Yes, the symbolism is, I mean, just straightforwardly on the surface here. We don't have to go any deeper than that. Um, But then that was an opportunity in which then the hunters could leap out from behind the tree and kill her. Um, And so we get that in these tapestries. So we have the unicorn sort of, I mean, it's this incredibly beautiful creature. And in one of the scenes, it's putting its horn into a stream. And then all the animals of the kingdom, whatever, are there together. So the lion and the lamb are, you know, just relaxedly drinking from this stream. There's a hyena. This is in Europe, it looks like, but there's a hyena there and a lion, but they are all sort of tamed by its glorious and beautiful presence. Um, And the horn was believed to be proof against poison. So by dipping its horn in the stream, what it's doing is making that stream safe for all the animals to drink. Uh, But then the people, of course, kill it. Um, But there is another image in this cycle, which the way they've got them displayed at the cloisters anyway, they're around a room and so you could start or end on this one, which is called the Unicorn in Captivity. And there, there's this beautiful unicorn, and it's underneath a tree, and it has a collar around its neck. Um, And it is chained um, with this diaphanous uh, golden chain, which clearly would not um, be capable of restraining it if it so chose. uh, so chaining it in place. And there is a uh, very short fence all around it. And so what we get is a scene which is at least often interpreted as the unicorn sort of allowing its captivity. Hmm. It's, got, it's got the um, collar around its neck. It has this thin golden chain and this ring around it. It could escape all of these, but it's choosing captivity. Um And this is therefore interpreted as, you know, the man in this betrothal um, choosing 
the <laughs> brink of marriage, willfully choosing to bridle himself with this. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how convincing these interpretations are. There's a pair of initials, uh, an A and an E, that are like woven together um, all around the throughout all of the tapestries in this cycle. And so it's often viewed, uh, who was A, who was E, that they are, you know, betrothed. And uh, um, the last time I researched this anyway, it was still quite speculative what that all meant. But I I do think if we look at that unicorn, the, the collar that's around its neck is sort of hanging open, the tail of it, like it's through the buckle, but then it's not slid through like another loop. So it's, loosely containing it you know there, there, there does seem to be something to the sort of contentment on the uh, unicorn's face as it is seemingly by choice submitting to this captivity so it's collar the collar has a ring in it the ring is attached to a um a chain and yeah you're right so normally when you put in the a belt a belt you put the little tab through the hole yeah. and then you slip the the loose in through the uh the loop and then it closes tight but that's not it uh, that it, end of it, it dangles loosely yeah and the chain doesn't seem to be really it's kind of attached to the tree maybe <laughs> yeah, it's not really clear what is holding the chain up at all it loops around the tree and then just what it just <laughs> kind of stops um so yeah i don't know and it's also a very thin chain um the other thing that i'd note about that collar is the loose end of it that's hanging pendulously down mm-hmm. is extremely phallic. <laughs> I mean, extremely. I I hadn't thought about the analogy. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so if we're still thinking again about the role of the horn there, which is associated with sexuality, hence the lore of the virgin, um, again, this seems a nod toward that. Um and if you see, there are like red drips. On I was it. wondering about that. Is that blood? Well, it looks very much like blood. But if you go up in the image to the tree above him, you'll see it's a pomegranate tree. Oh. And you can see some of the pomegranates are bursting with ripeness. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, what you get is a kind of pointed ovoid form in the middle of some of them um, that is of a sort of pale and fleshy color on the outside and then a rich red on the interior yes <laughs> uh, so pomegranate is often a sort of emblem of female sexuality um and so uh and it is of course also full of these seeds which are emblematic of reproduction and fertility um and so yeah it seems like that is what's actually dripping on him this tapestry, now that you've pointed these out, is very, very entertaining and very, very, you know, it's it's kind of amazing. But it's also kind of, I feel like for the husband, this feels kind of heavy. <laughs> like, what are the expectations here? <laughs> they, it is a lot to live up to. That unicorn horn is quite impressive. Yeah, it's a wonderful cycle of tapestries. There is also, I should say, a complete Christological reading of this where the unicorn is Jesus. Um I am far less convinced that that's what's going on. But that said, medieval imagery, one of the things that makes it wonderful is people often have this idea that it's very doctrinal, that like there's one official church reading of these images and that that's it. There's nothing else to be done with them. And I, we can find times and places where uh, religious uh, figures are working very hard, you know, bishops and popes and so on to control the interpretation of images. But on the whole, medieval art is very open to interpretation. Um, and I think that's kind of baked in to its design. Uh, we have so many images, right? We live in the most uh, image-saturated moment in the history of the world. And so we will look at literally thousands of images every day. But medieval art grows out of a monastic tradition where monks would check themselves into a monastery, often sort of in their later childhood. Um, some of the most famous monks began their period um, as oblates, as, as, as aspiring monks, you know, when they were six or seven years old. And then they live in the monastery their entire life, often literally never leaving. And so the image programs there, be they, you know, architectural sculpture or monuments or the manuscripts they had, would have been images that people saw, these monks saw 
every day or every week or every moment in the same sort of part of the liturgical year, every year, for their whole lives. Um, and if we think about the libraries these places had, so uh, Canterbury had, you know, what was probably the most impressive library in medieval England. I have more books in my office than they had at the library in, in Canterbury. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and that's just the books I have here, not the three times as many that are at my house, you know? I mean, they had, you know, maybe a couple of hundred books. Um, really, that's not a lot. And so the, and many of them will not have any images in them. The ones that are illustrated, people would have had a lot of opportunities to look at them. And a work of art that yields all of its content, all of its meaning, all of its impact on a first viewing is not suited to this environment. It's a failure. The works have to be open enough to continue to speak to people throughout their, you know, throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the year, throughout their lifetime. Um, and so they often have what I tend to think of as a sort of calculated openness. Yeah, there's a bunch of imagery in front of you that's guiding you to think about certain topics or th certain themes or even to think about them in certain ways. But they rarely are um, uh, proscriptive, saying you must come away with this image having concluded this. They're not propaganda. They're not billboards. You know, a billboard has to hit you over the head because you're going to see it for a matter of seconds <laughs> while driving down the highway while trying not to get run over by a semi, right? Yeah. Um, it's not a great place for subtlety. But medieval images are very subtle um, and have, I mean, not all, of course, but uh, it is a sort of standard feature of the period to be very rich and offering up a whole lot of content for potential um contemplation well like you said like you said some of these like a lot of this art is done by monks and monks by their very nature like the nature of the job is to be in a meditative state right so i can imagine that you're just sort of stewing and meditating and thinking about the image and honestly probably getting a little bit bored at times and then just like <laughs> ha 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 maybe let me put this in here let's see if they, anyone will notice so oh, absolutely yeah. uh in this tapestry in the unicorn tapestry which i should say this is a secular work this isn't monastic but it does grow out of a larger medieval monastic artistic tradition there are a couple of little easter eggs in it there's a bunch of uh insects yeah, there's a, a like dragonfly in there and a butterfly and there is a really cute little frog in here somewhere he's kind of yellowish it's very where's waldo yes exactly i haven't looked for this frog in years um but when i used to i worked at the cloisters for a little while and i gave a lot of tours to uh summer camp groups and of course you know you want to get the children's attention we do to say all right first thing we do everybody find the frog you know <laughs> And then they're all, you know, glued to the thing, doing a Where's Waldo. They're all excited to find the frog. And they generally succeeded, but he is difficult to spot. Um, I should say, all of these flowers, all of the plants in here, are identifiable by species. Um, so a botanist has gone through this whole tapestry and identified what every single one of these things is. Um, I forget how many plant species, but I'm pretty sure there's over 100 plant species represented in this cycle of tapestries. Um, and so that, again, uh, gives a lot of opportunity, given that flowers often had kind of, uh, first off, just kind of decorative uses. Second, uh, more practical, say, medicinal uses. Third, they often had various kinds of symbolic meanings. Uh, and so, you know, a flower is not just a flower. A flower is a whole subject for potential contemplation. Um, and so, yeah, a tapestry like this would give somebody ample opportunity to look into it, become distracted and bored, back out of it, and then re-engage periodically over, you know, presumably this just hung in some very rich person's home um, in a room where they probably spent a lot of time and mostly ignored it right because that's what we do with the things we hang on our walls at home um <laughs> but we also see them kind of always and pointedly at certain times ha i found the frog but yeah anyway tons of fun stuff throughout all of the the series of unicorn tapestries not just this one uh probably the most iconic image the one that's most reproduced partly because it doesn't have a bunch of people killing a unicorn and then slinging its corpse over the back of a horse to carry it home <laughs> just to sort of i let get the audience to understand 
the kind of breadth of possible meanings you can put into just the unicorn, at least in this case, right? You have the one where it's a symbol for the husband, male virility, but then you also have talked about it as a symbol of Jesus. And there's a talk that you had where you talked about where it's the Virgin Mary and the unicorn with its head in her lap, and then the two individuals coming up behind it to, to attack. Um, right. Which is that, that particular um, <laughs> uh, anti-Semitic racist image. So really, really broad, <laughs> really broad in meanings. Yeah, I mean, uh, and they often operated on several levels at once. Even if you're just staying in the religious sphere, it was very common for medieval exegetes. So that's people who uh, like write commentaries on biblical texts um, to give a range of different meanings. So they w- might give, for example, you get one line out of uh, the Psalms or whatever. One line is say, first, the literal meaning. This means that, you know, the shepherd gathers his sheep. Then the allegorical meaning, which is, well, the shepherd is Jesus and the sheep are the flock. And then you could get a, um, an apocalyptic meaning, um, you know, which foretells the end of time by such and such. And so they were used to thinking about a range of different modes for reading the same image such that uh, you would, even if you were sticking just with these sort of predetermined doct- doctrinally approved readings, there would still be several of any single line in a biblical text. And of course, an image of a unicorn is not straightforwardly a biblical text, though there are unicorns in the Bible. Um, So uh, the kinds of modes of reading and interpretive practices that were developed specifically to think about um, biblical texts, and I should say this is absolutely true both in Christian and in Jewish and also in uh, Islamic or Muslim um, contemplative devotional practices. Of course, the texts contemplated vary some, but um, the practice of chewing over a religious text uh, is common across the three major uh, religions that are active in Europe and the kind of Mediterranean basin uh, throughout the Middle Ages and on to the Renaissance and arguably on from there into the present. Um, and of course, other religious traditions do the same thing, but we're thinking just about that region. Those are the three big ones. You know, you know, in my experience, I, I don't know the experience of the of the listener, right? If you go to church, presumably preacher comes up with a new sermon every single week, 52 weeks in the year, you know, their career is going to be 20, 30 years long. Right. You, you know, even as long as the Bible or whatever text you're using is, as long as it is, you're going to kind of repeat yourself after a while. So you have to like really, really meditate and kind of ruminate over these ideas over and over again. Well, absolutely. And even if you take um, the sort of standard uh, Catholic Bible, which was first developed in its, you know, organization and form by this guy, St. Jerome, um, in the late classical period. He's the one who picks like which tech, which Jewish scriptural texts to include, which of the many gospels that were floating around in the period to include, what other Christian texts to include, and so assembles them all, picks the order, and that's how you get what is often just thought of as like the the Bible or the Christian Bible. And a lot of that book is really dull, and most people <laughs> don't read it. Um, it is. There are some passages that are very exciting. The the last book in there, the one that's full of all the monsters, that one's fun. You know, the Book of Revelation and the Apocalypse. Um, that's all exciting, right? Um, but you know, there's other ones like that just aren't, um, and people don't tend to make sermons around every portion of the Bible. They tend to hit the high points, you know. Um, and in Jewish scripture, really, the first five are the ones where all of the focus really is. It's a whole lot of other Jewish books, but the Torah just has those five, right? Which is uh, what Exod- uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Leviticus. Not in that order. I muddled that up. But anyway, <laughs> um, so those are the ones that will receive far and away the most sort of attention and contemplation. But there's no fixed answer to what they mean. There's constant uh, reinterpretations, debates, arguments, fights over what all this stuff means. Um, and then even in a very top down religious structure like Catholicism, where, you know, the Pope is in theory, really setting the determinative, uh, readings on all these things. There are huge questions that are absolutely fundamental to the religion that take 
a millennia to sort out. They don't decide, for example, whether the Eucharist, so, you know, it, the, uh, the mass ceremony is the consumption of bread or a wafer and wine, uh, comes from the scene in the Last Supper where Jesus says, this is my uh, body, eat of me, this is my blood, drink of me. Was that a literal statement or was it a symbol? Is it an actual miracle called transubstantiation where the wine actually becomes blood, literally becomes blood, and the wafer or bread literally becomes Jesus' flesh? Or is it a symbol, a metaphor? That debate goes on in the Catholic Church until 1215. You know, so a thousand years of Christians, this is the central right and practice of the religion. And they haven't even decided whether it's symbolic or a kind of cannibalism. <laughs> they decide, by the way, that, that it's literal, that it really is a miracle and it is this kind of biblically sanctioned cannibalism. But, um, but yeah, that takes an entire millennium to, uh, to conclude. Thus concludes the first part of our interview with Dr. Mimmon. Join us for the next episode, in which we'll talk more about monsters and the wild men in medieval Europe. Now we come to the part of the show where we plot to kill the players. I didn't get to ask Dr. Mittman about his opinion, but our talk did get me brainstorming. The discussion of unicorns being more symbolic masculinity really took me for a loop. Me, personally, I'm more used to unicorns being associated with rainbows, Lisa Frank, and an overall much more girly aesthetic. Not really sure how it ended up that way. Maybe something to do with girls and horses, or maybe unicorns' current association with fantasy and post-Victorian fairies. But thinking it over, it's not that surprising. Animal behavior often gets labeled with more anthropomorphic qualities. Foxes are able to steal chickens and are called clever. Dogs bark at strangers and are called protective or loyal. So I was just thinking that maybe, may, maybe, maybe. I should start applying a set of behaviors to certain monsters. Dragons like gold and shiny things. And now actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm, I'm really thinking of Japanese yokai. Kamikiri, Azuki Arai, Tenjo Name, and a bunch of other spirits and goblins whose distinct characteristics is their behavior. So what kinds of behavior should I give tick monsters? It needs to be something terrifying but exploitable. Understandable, but malleable and therefore ambiguous. For example, if you're being chased by a vampire and you spill a bunch of small objects on the floor, the vampire has to stop and count all of them. Don't know why, that's just how it works. But it can't just be a weakness like that. I think maybe tick monsters should have a preference? Like a specific blood type that they prefer? A, B, O, blood types are possible, but that's kind of a weird thing to ask players to decide during their character creation. It, it might give away the game. Oh, oh, I know. I should base the tick monster's preference based on the last thing the players ate. Like, there are folk beliefs about eating specific kinds of foods, and then those foods will attract mosquitoes. Ooh, 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 ooh maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe whoever was the last person to eat steak, salmon, bananas, I don't know. It needs to be something attractive, attractive to eat, and also kind of ubiquitous. Oh, I know. Donuts. Bronze Age fools and copper lights, chamber pots and Templar knights. Study, read, then be burnt in effigy. Because we make fun of archaeology, and we also do dinosaurs. Yes, we also do dinosaurs.